cheap gaming computer. You said it couldn't be done. And yet here we are, ladies and gentlemen, because we are genuinely building a cheap gaming computer in 2022. And I know what you're thinking, how? But actually the solution is very simple. We're going to be using one of these, a Ryzen 5 5600G, which is essentially a kick-ass gaming CPU, but with one of these almost baked into it. Which essentially means that expensive graphics cards can now be a thing of the past. This is very much going to be the cheapest gaming computer that you can buy in 2022, and as always we're going to walk you through all of the components that you need, everything that I like about the build and things that I would change, and of course we're going to give you those all-important gameplay benchmark numbers and all of the latest titles so you know exactly how this thing performs. Let's get started, after a quick word from this video sponsor. I was going to say without further ado, but obviously an advert is technically a do, if that makes sense. Acer's Predator Triton 500SE is a sleek yet powerful gaming beast, packing the latest 12th generation Intel CPUs, Nvidia RTX 30 series mobile graphics, and one touch overclocking. Acer Predator machines also come with Xbox Game Pass for PC included, so you can get playing Halo Infinite, Age of Empires 4, and Forza Horizon 5 without any extra cost. Learn more today with that link down below. I'd tell you what, I have been so excited to put this one together for months. I actually filmed all of the B-roll for this, but then like Intel launch, Christmas, emotional damage. And then a bunch of other things cropped up and it meant that I didn't actually get round to properly putting this video together. This is called the H100 and I'm not even sure if they sell this anymore. This has been sitting around in my closet for around about two years. Mainly because I didn't want to do this thing injustice because I mean look at this. This is an absolutely beautiful case and the previous generation of the Ryzen APUs in my opinion have been good, but they've not quite been good enough to properly recommend, I think, to most people. So in combination with the fact that you really can't buy a graphics card at all at the moment, this seemed like the right time to raise it from the dead. Typically when you buy components as well, the smaller they are, the less physical materials that they actually take up, obviously the lower the price is gonna be. And I really like to sort of use that to my advantage when I'm building systems like this. Of course, that does mean you're gonna have to go for an ITX motherboard. The one that we've got here is a B550M ITX AC. And this is a brilliant budget board and it has pretty much all of the features that you're going to need with the exception of two things. Firstly the AC Wi-Fi on this isn't the fastest. I think you're going to cap out around about like 150 maybe 200 megabits a second. Don't quote me on that but it's definitely not like full Wi-Fi 6 if you're wanting to run this properly wirelessly. But the much more important thing to bear in mind is that this doesn't actually have any USB flashback capability and if you get an older motherboard, so this one is rocking version 1.5, not 1.6, it will actually mean that this CPU won't work in the motherboard and you'll have to update the BIOS with a different chip. Now this isn't going to be a problem if you have like a local hardware store you can go into and they actually will do this service for you. That is just ultimately the problem with AMD when they release these chips so much later than the rest of the motherboards. I just wish that there was a proper way to actually know what the motherboard BIOS version was before you buy one of these, because if you've had one that's been produced in like the last eight months or so, then you should be fine, but you just don't know that. This could have been sitting in a box for over a year. But for now, we're going to lay this on top of our motherboard box, and then we're gonna pick up our chip. This is our Ryzen 5 5600G. This obviously isn't gonna be quite as powerful as the latest proper Ryzen chips, but it's not actually that far behind it, to be honest with you, and especially if if you're playing things like, I don't know, CSGO or Fortnite, it doesn't really matter at all. It's gonna give you plenty of juice for 1080p gaming. And if you do decide to upgrade your system later and actually put in a dedicated graphics card, this is still gonna be an absolutely awesome chip. What was I just talking about? Look, you actually get a warning in the box saying that you might need to update your BIOS in order to get this to work. But this in itself isn't really that helpful. It's almost like AMD saying, look, it's not my fault. I've told you about it, but it's not our fault. But just grab the CPU out of its container, lift up this little lever on the motherboard, and then just gently drop your Ryzen APU down into place, making sure that the arrows actually line up with the one that's on the motherboard. Lower this socket back down. Then you can grab your oversized screwdriver that I've missed so much and remove this AMD mounting hardware that you find on the motherboard because the stock caller actually uses screws. AMD mounting is actually quite confusing. I think they could improve on that for AM5. Then you can pick up your stock caller because of course, yes, we're not gonna be buying anything additional. This is the cheapest gaming PC that you can buy right now, mostly. To be honest, the AMD one actually isn't too bad. It is better than the stock Intel cooler, but obviously a little bit later down the line, you can upgrade this and you'll get a quieter system. You wouldn't normally need to do this next step, but because Max AMD is pretty tight and sent me a used sample, there isn't actually 
any thermal paste pre-applied to this cooler. So what I'm gonna do is grab a tube from my handy dandy drawer and just drop a little dash in the middle of this. Then we can pick up our cooler and just gently lay it on top of the socket and then you can just screw it down into place. And it'll make this awful noise. But that is actually correct, believe it or not. Then you can grab the fan cable for the CPU cooler and then just gently plug this in over the header at the top of the board. We're then going to need some RAM and here we have our crucial ballistics. Of course, we're gonna forgo RGB here because it's extra money that we just don't need to spend. But interestingly enough, this is the first proper cheap budget gaming system I think I've done that has used 16 gigabytes of RAM because it's come down in price so much now. Of course, because this is an ITX motherboard, you only have two slots for your RAM, so it should be pretty self-explanatory really. You just need to grab your stick, line it up with the slot and then push it down until it clicks. Of course, you're going to need some storage to actually get the system to work. And this was pretty much the cheapest, best value SSD I could find on Amazon at the time of purchase. It's not gonna be the fastest out there, but this is actually a proper PCI generation three drive. So you are gonna get some extra performance versus a SATA one. I think in terms of caching speed and things like that, it's definitely not the best drive out there. It is noticeably a little bit slower than some of the other drives I've used recently. And it also looks a little bit silly because there's literally just your storage and then your controller and that's it. So while the speed is gonna be a little bit of a compromise for some people, I think the main thing really that you need to be aware of is obviously the capacity of the drive. Because 500 gigabytes is what I'd recommend for a budget PC, but this is very much a minimum. If you are an existing PC gamer or you just want to have loads of different titles installed at the same time, 500 gigabytes just isn't enough. You don't wanna get stuck with one drive that you just want to upgrade immediately. I would advise waiting like an extra month if you need to and buying a terabyte if that is something that is gonna affect you. Installing it is very straightforward Forward though, you just slide it in, push it into place, grab your protective heatsink, and then just lay that back on top and then screw it into place. And then the pretty crazy thing now is that this is quite literally your gaming PC. Yes, we're gonna put it in a chassis. Yes, we're gonna have to power it, but this very much is the brains of the operation. Everything that's gonna happen is on this motherboard. Hashtag thick. Oh, this is one of those blooming cases, isn't it, where they over tighten the screws on the back, just generally upsetting everybody. Cooler master, come on, why? Why do this? Remove the side panel. <laughs> that is so diddy. Just for comparison purposes, this is the side panel of an ATX case. Big difference. Interestingly enough, I think that's actually the only side panel that does come off of this. Everything else seems to well, very much be the same. But the whole idea of this is that you do have that one big central chamber at the front, one very large 200 mil fan that blows air all the way through this. You can put like additional SSDs and things on this plate, but in order to actually install your motherboard, you're gonna have to remove this. Would have been nice if this was tallest, but you know, beggars can't be choosers, right? RGB controller inside. Nice, but otherwise, not that much else. It is very much just a big box for an ITX motherboard with a huge stonking fan on the front. The first step is gonna to be to grab your IO shield from your motherboard box if it has one. Just gently insert this and push it into place. Then you can grab your motherboard and just gently lower this one down on top of those screw holes, lining it up with the IO shield. Use the included screws to then fix this down. You then be left with a motherboard and a bunch of cables and surprise, surprise, these need to be connected to the motherboard. So we can lay this up, up right now. Then you find a USB 3.0 for the front USB ports. You've got HD audio to actually get the audio to work. So the analog headset and microphone in, power switch, reset switch, power LEDs. You've got a three pin fan header for the fan and then a non-addressable RGB for, you guessed it, the RGB lighting. It's definitely a little bit on the fiddly side to actually get all of these connected. I don't think there's any way I can properly show you in great detail, but the USB cable goes here. Just below it are the power connections and then the HD audio is here at the left on the motherboard. Now, the reason that I did actually want to have this on the set is to illustrate what it would look like if you did want to upgrade this with a budget-friendly graphics card. I mean, this is gonna set you back 250, 300 quid RRP, really, so it's, uh, it's definitely not actually a budget card, but the point being, it needs to be quite small in order to actually fit in here. You can see there's actually quite a lot of room with this RTX 3050, 
but if you wanted to go for something more substantial, especially something that had like three fans or two big ones, it's probably not going to fit. So you definitely need to measure this before picking this case. But again, you can go for the NR200P if you want to upgrade this later with a much bigger graphics card. But I think that for now, we can move on to our next and final step, which is actually just installing the power supply. Told you this should be quite a quick build. You just want to remove this little bay at the back. Then you can pick up your power supply. And the one that I've chosen here is the EVGA 600W2. But the reason that I like this one is it's all about value for money. You're getting actually quite a lot here for around about 40 to 50 pounds, depending on when and where you buy this. All of the cables are also jet black, so you have quite a nice, neat build. Not that it matters too much in this system. But with 600 watts of power, you can actually upgrade this to something like an RTX 3060 a little bit later if you want to, and still have enough juice for it to work without swapping out your power supply. The only issue is that there are obviously quite a lot of cables here that you are going to need to tidy up. I believe you get this plate, and you push this over the side, screw it down into place, you will want to make sure that the fan is actually facing the cooler so the cooler can sort of blow air into this and out. But because this chassis is so small, you're going to want to feed the cables through one by one and actually plug these in now because you won't be able to easily do this later. I can't see what I'm doing, which is brilliant. Oh, I think that's it. Our CPU power connections. And we're going to plug this in exactly the same way at the top of the motherboard here. This is definitely a case where having a modular power supply, or at least a semi-modular power supply, would come in handy, because this is going to get messy. So we're going to have to sort of feed all of these through, gently push it into place. Then we can assess the damage, which, okay, actually isn't too bad all the time we don't have a GPU in here. I assume we can fold this top cable at the top, maybe? And then the rest of them we can sort of fold together. You just want to make sure that the fan isn't going to be touching any of the cables. And then otherwise, that is pretty much our gaming PC done. Not exactly the prettiest from the inside, is it? But that bit doesn't matter. We're going to break tradition and put the side panel on before we've tested it, because I do want to see what this actually looks like. And then, yeah, there you go. Our budget gaming PC, or the cheapest gaming PC that you can build in 2022, is finished. It neatens up quite well. It's like a well-shaved man. I'm quite excited to get this turned on, actually. We will grab ourselves a display, and of course we're only going for 1080p here. This is high refresh rate. I don't think we're going to be utilising this in anything other than like Valorant. But if you do want to play Valorant or any sort of esports title, don't underestimate this thing. Grab ourselves a keyboard and a mouse. That, I think, together probably costs the same amount as the computer. I might be exaggerating that a tiny bit, but I think if you did the maths, you would be very surprised. Okay, I'm definitely ready for this. Let's give it a little Flick of the switch, press the on button, and immediately it looks great. It has lit up. We've got some RGB lighting, but are we going to get a display output? Oh, 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 new CPU installed. Yes, boys. Which means grabbing our copy of Windows 10 or 11 on a USB drive and slotting it in. Restart your computer and then just follow the on-screen instructions. Here we are then, all set up and ready to go. And as you can clearly see, the size of this thing is tiny. We're going to start with some F1 2021. Just to make you aware though, we are going to have to do our recording with the Xbox game overlay, which probably is going to reduce our frame rate by around about 3 to 5 FPS, so take these numbers with a slight pinch of salt. We are running this at the ultra low preset, so we're not going to be winning any awards for graphics quality, but it doesn't actually look anywhere near as bad as I would have thought. This is running at 1080p with FSR. This is Azerbaijan, so this is actually pretty intense. A lot of the other tracks will probably be a little bit easier to drive. I've just realized the joke that I've made there, because I'm a genius. So if you're looking forward to the 2022 season and you want to get some practice in, then this is actually a surprisingly good PC to do it on, despite its cost. Oh no, I have no wing. Noise test for you. Let's move on to some single player with some Civilization VI Gathering Storm and we're going to load up my save called About to Win Eleanor. Well the game certainly loaded very quickly which is great to see. This is 1080p medium settings with some anti-aliasing and this is perfectly playable. I mean this is 35 frames a second. The game actually looks pretty fantastic to be honest with you. If we go into the graphics menu though and we turn anti-aliasing off and we lower the settings down to low. Yeah, you can see immediately the game actually doesn't look too different at all and we've bumped up to 60 FPS. So this is definitely how I would choose to play this game. That's my royalty free version of the Civ theme.
But I really think it's time to up the ante properly with some high refresh rate gaming with some Valorant. Let's set all of the graphics options to medium, shall we? And sure enough, at settings I would describe as good looking, we're getting around about 80 FPS. If you do want to knock things down to low though, and turn anti-aliasing down to FXAA, then this is actually when you're going to see a huge difference. You can see around about 140 FPS now. Yes, the game definitely doesn't look the same. I don't think there's any disputing that. But if you're playing to win, this is definitely the settings that you'd want to use. I'll also add that as soon as I actually stopped recording, we've jumped all the way up to around about 200 FPS now. Which means that finally we can move on to my favourite title, and it's a new season, baby. Some Apex Legends. Will it run? Or will it go... Um, I'm not entirely sure this is going to be the best Apex Legends machine. It does run, just not as well as Valorant with around about 30 to 40 FPS whilst recording. So it is playable, make no mistake, it is playable. Oh, volumetric lighting, sunspot shadows, does that help? Oh, yes it does, there we go. I mean, you and me both are just gonna have to spectate for a second, around about 40 to 65 FPS, depending on what you're doing in the game. But all in all, actually, colour me quite impressed. Not only is the system a good looking one, it's a practical one, it's one that you could take with you from place to place, but if you're just looking to get into PC gaming and you'll save as much money as you can, you can't or just don't want to get yourself a dedicated GPU, then I think this is very much a, a winner of a system. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Does this have enough performance for you, or would you rather get something else? Would you wait entirely to get a bigger PC? Don't forget to absolutely smash that like button, get yourself subscribed, and and of course, if you do want to check out current pricing on any of the parts that were featured in this rig, then you can find that link down below with my Amazon affiliate links. And of course, while you're down there, don't forget to check out Acer's awesome Predator Triton 500 SE. This gaming laptop is so sleek, yet so powerful, with gaming performance that is perfect for true next generation gaming on the go. Not only that, but you'll also have plenty of titles to choose from, as Xbox Game Pass for PC is included for a crazy wide range of gaming bliss all on demand. Grab yours today with that link down below. Thank you so much for watching, I'll catch you in the next one.